Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. We are going to go way back into the midst of time um, to look at the nuts and bolts of evolutionary psychology and what we can learn from it as researchers um, with a view to uh, enhancing our understanding of, of human behavior. Um, and so in particular, we are going to be reviewing that classic staple of market research, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And uh, we're going to propose a different needs model, uh, which is grounded in evolutionary psychology theory. So we'd like to kick off with um, an example of uh, evolutionary instincts in action. Let's talk a little bit about what evolutionary psychology is. So. Um, here we are. Um, this is the, the Northern Line in London, um, around about 8.30 a.m. in the morning at Clapham Common uh, Underground Station. Um, and I often think that this is one of the few times that you genuinely see survival of the fittest in action in London. Um, because when the Northern Line train pulls into the station, you can really feel the energy shift as people brace themselves and adopt what I think of as their boarding stance. Because not everybody is going to get on board. Uh, and some people will probably have had to let three or four trains go by before they even hope to get near the door. So it's imperative that you strike the optimum stance and position because it's either you or your neighbor who are going to get to their marketing meeting on time. And evolutionary principles such as these drive behavior in practically every aspect of our daily lives. Evolution is what gives rise to our most utterly uh, instinctive emotions and behavior. So, for example, if you consider the following scenarios, if someone uh, in the room that you're sitting in right now were to suddenly loudly scream right now, imagine if you suddenly spotted uh, a very large spider crawling up your shoe, or imagine if the lights that are in the room you're sitting in right now were suddenly inexplicably to go off. Your reactions to these scenarios would be inherited response mechanisms, which we are biologically programmed to experience. So that is to say that they are all examples of inherited behavior that have been passed on through generations because of natural selection. And they're the reason that we have all successfully made it through to 2018 and are sitting here today. They're essentially the tools of our evolutionary survival kit. And studies have shown empirically time after time that people from almost any culture in the world would react to those scenarios in exactly the same way. And not only that, but when you prime people to be in a certain frame of mind, we can also predict their subsequent behavior. So let's outline some of these central tenets of evolutionary psychology. And the first is probably one of the most well known, which is that every living species that exists today is a product of biological adaptations over time, which enabled them to survive the process of natural selection. So essentially we've survived because as a species, we've adopted traits that helped us overcome different evolutionary challenges and meant that our genes were passed on to the next generation. Number two, is that evolutionary adapt adaptations take place over thousands of years. So our modern day minds and instincts are actually a result of adaptation designed to maximize fitness in the hunter-gatherer society because that is the environment in which they evolved. That also means that today's evolutionary challenges will only bear their biological fruit thousands of years from now. This explains why constant exposure to inflammatory or depressing news headlines has a negative impact on our well-being or why keeping up with the Joneses is a real thing. Number three, evolutionary psychology suggests that our emotions are the executive, executive arm of natural selection. They exist because they prompt or reward behavior that enables our genes to survive and reproduce. Of course, we want to experience pleasure and avoid pain, but these instincts ultimately serve deeper evolutionary needs. Fourth, and probably most importantly, we are acutely and consistently aware of our role in the wider group. We're designed to work out what does and doesn't impress in our cultures and act accordingly. So our actions are heavily influenced by culture, both at a subconscious and conscious level. And while our culture can actually sometimes push our behavior against the grain of evolutionary logic, we adapt to that new cultural paradigm because of that evolutionarily driven desire not to fall out of favor in our social groups. So this, ex this explains, for example, why people in every culture on earth basically gossip about the same things. Triumphs, tragedy, misfortune, fidelity, betrayal. Attitudes can change quickly and often over a lifetime, but basic instincts don't. 
So once we actually understand that our basic human need to assert our place in amongst the pack at any given moment is what drives most of our behavior, a lot actually falls into place. So the next question is then, how can we integrate all of these learnings into what we do as researchers? So I'm sure everybody is very familiar with this. Um, and, and as a model for human needs, Maslow's hierarchy has been in popular use now for about 80 years. Um, but we think that it's wrong and evolutionary psychology can help us understand why. At face value, Maslow's hierarchy of needs does make intuitive sense because it does make sense uh, that we should first and foremost seek to satisfy our most basic physiological and safety needs and then be concerned with other things around you know, belonging and self-actualization. But the problem is that Maslow's hierarchy actually ignores the strategies that we use to achieve our most basic needs. The first point is that contrary to Maslow's hierarchy, we definitely don't always prioritize safety and security above our social or status needs. For example, 18 year olds routinely put their lives at risk in an effort to gain status among their peers, driving too fast, taking drugs, getting dangerously drunk. Women wear heels they could easily break an ankle in. Mountaineers risk life and limb in pursuit of self-actualization. And we do all of these things in pursuit of status, affiliation, or mate acquisition goals within our respective groups. And those groups in return might benefit us in some way. And the second point is that ego and self-actualization are actually not superior needs as suggested by Maslow. They are in fact evolved strategies that help us secure basic level needs to ensure that we have the support of our wider group to help us achieve our survival and our reproductive goals. And one of the ways in which we see self-actualization and ego needs manifested is through virtue signaling. So that is to say, behaving in ways that indicate our worthiness to the wider group or that show that we are deserving of their help and support. And we do this uh, both consciously and unconsciously. Everyone does it across all cultures in different ways. And since the 1950s, of course, people have also used brands as part of their virtue signaling toolkit to send out messages about their status. Even so-called rebellious anti-mainstream groups are nonetheless groups with their own status systems in place. And of course now people use social media as a means of virtue signaling. Glance through your Facebook feed and you'll see how we present ourselves as successful or good parents, showing our support or disagreement with a cultural idea. Ultimately, we are using social media to construct a highly self-aware image of ourselves with the aim ultimately of impressing others. And then the third point is that Maslow also suggests that belonging is a superior need. But in fact, status within the wider group has always been absolutely central to achieving our most basic needs. Belonging is one of the most fundamental ways that you can secure advantageous survival and reproductive benefits. Collaboration with friends, family and allies has for thousands of years been a key aspect of this. And as researchers, we all know that whenever groups of people come together, however big or small, some sort of hierarchy inevitably unfolds. And you see that in the form of whose jokes are laughed at, whose jokes are not laughed at, who is agreed with, who is disagreed with, and ultimately whose lead people follow. We are all acutely aware of our place in the pecking order at all times. So, in short, Maslow doesn't really capture that messy reality of human behaviour, that we are selfishly motivated and we are evolutionarily programmed to be selfishly motivated, but we have to reach goals through co cooperation and through compromise with others. To survive, that means that sometimes we help our neighbours and sometimes we exploit them. And you observe and experience examples of this behaviour when you start looking for it every day. So then we ask ourselves, what model can we actually use to give us a better picture of that messy reality of human motives and behaviors? We feel that the seven fundamental motives model outlined by Vladis Griskovicius and Douglas Kenrick in their 2013 paper is a great start. The model outlines the seven core reasons which underpin most of our behavior. This includes status, affiliation, mate acquisition, mate retention, kin care, disease avoidance, and self-protection. It supports the premise that people usually don't know the true or ultimate reason for their behavior. Instead, people give approximate reason, which reasonably explains their motives. It's one which they are able or willing to identify. 
you can recognize Maslow in some of these. But the main distinction between Maslow and the seven fundamental motives is that the seven fundamental motives recognizes that there is no linear progression from physiological through safety, through belonging to self-actualization. And in fact, it's that we move in and out of these needs at any given moment during the day. It's kind of like our brain is a platform of apps, each designed to deal with a specific problem. And we have different psychological systems for dealing with these different challenges and needs. Sometimes these needs are at odds with each other. A good solution to one evolutionary problem may be incompatible with another. Let's take Amazon. People love to hate Amazon for being too greedy, too big, too ruthless, but we still love getting our parcels the next day. We know plastic is bad for the environment, but we love our morning latte. We don't like being spied on online, but fear of missing out keeps us checking social media. People grapple with these conflicts in their motives daily. And there's a clear link with behavioral economic thinking here. Think of how social proof, confirmation bias, or framing enable us to navigate these daily conflicts. Mental shortcuts help us throughout the day, and these biases are rooted in evolutionary motives. So where does the potential for behavior change come in? Well, it turns out that a fundamental motive can actually be activated by external cues. Remember the spider, the scream, and the blackout examples we gave you earlier? Well, these activated the self-protection system. Watching a crime program or a thriller can have that same effect. And that leads people to tend to want to conform or follow others. They want to stick with what they know and play it safe with their choices. On the other hand, activating the mate acquisition system prompts people to want to stand out from the crowd. So this suggests that behavioral biases, while they certainly exist, may actually be a stronger influence at some times than others. And that's all depending on how the individual has been primed to react. This clearly has profound implications for how we approach behavior change and the environment that brands create for their customers. So to wrap up, what do we take from this as researchers? And I think that um, the, one of the really useful things about um, evolutionary psychology as, uh, from a research point of view is, that it, is its ability to help us understand what's really driving behavior. Um, and as an alternative to Maslow, we think that the seven fundamental motives um, represents human behavior far more accurately um, in all of its glorious irrationality. And so considering which evolutionary need state has been activated in a given situation and the impact that that might have on what people choose to prioritize and how they behave in the given moment um, is, is clearly a very useful uh, thing to be aware of. And so it's all about being um, aware and taking into a, um, a consideration the wider context. Noticing also the choice of proximate reason that people give reveals an awful lot about a person's status goals within their wider group. Then always also remember that your target audience um, has a target audience of their own. So it is an interesting exercise to ask yourself, well, who, who is your target audience really striving to make an impression on um, in the context of your brand? And that will, of course, vary depending on the context. It might be peers, it might be the boss, women, uh, men, other mums in the schoolyard, and, and so on. And then finally, um, I think that it's also useful to ask what's really happening in, um, in your research conversations and what the implications are for, for analysis. Clearly, this is more of a qualitative um, outcome. But um, I think as a researcher, in any given situation where you are in conversation with another person or with a group of people, um, what you're witnessing is not so often uh, it, it, an, an objective assessment of the uh, topic or material, but it's, it's culture. It's culture in action. Interactions between people in a group setting reveal a lot about the role of a brand or an idea in a given culture. But it's important as researchers to maintain that, that sort of acute awareness of the dynamics at play um, during analysis as well as during moderation. So we think that really as a marketeer, it's, it's useful to understand whether your brand is likely to be sitting in line with the flow of natural impulses or whether perhaps you might be fighting an ingrained instinct, even if it does seem to be one that's in line with the, the current cultural zeitgeist. And ultimately, evolutionary psychology is concerned really with all the common ground that we all share as, as human beings. And we think that if you want to understand the processes that shape the human mind, um, then we can only benefit from understanding the process that shaped the human species. And perhaps now, uh, in this fractious age of offence where everybody seems to be very sensitive and you know, taking opposing sides on every possible debate under the sun, um, that common understanding uh, of humanity is becoming more important than ever. So that concludes our talk, and there you have to take any questions. Thank you very much, Sarah and Kimberly.
So again, audience members, if you're there and you've not had a chance yet to type in your question, please head to the Zoom Q&A box, type your question in there, or go to Twitter, type your question in and put hash and UMR at the end. Um, Sarah and Kim, one thing that I think people are probably thinking is, why have we been learning about Maslow's hierarchy of needs for so long with nobody questioning it? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think it's because it does make a lot of sense, um, you know, logically. Um, I think people think about it um, in the sense of, well, you know, why would you pursue, um, you know, self-actualization needs, um, you know, ha without having first secured your own safety and your, your own physiological needs? So I think the reason that we... Um, that we, we follow it is because I think it, it does intuitively feel right. Um, and it's only really when you look at it through um, the lens of evolutionary psychology, where you understand that really from birth, um, you are so heavily dependent on support of your wider group for your survival. Um, and, and therefore all these, the tactics that you see, um, even there are young children, in fact, especially there are young children adopting to secure the, that, that support, the tactics that kids adopt with their parents, with their siblings. Um, then you start to really see uh, how we use um, those supposedly more superior needs um, to, to secure those, those benefits for ourselves. Um, so I think, I think that um, we, we've, un we've, we've basically gone along with Maslow for so long because there was no reason to question it um, and it's only relatively recently where people have started to look at evolutionary psychology in the context of research um, and in the context of human behavior um, in more detail that, that um, those questions are starting to be raised now. Um, it's probably an interesting exercise you've undertaken to look at something that's widely accepted and then find an alternative that you think fits more. Do you have any plans to look at you know other theories, approaches that we've been using, you know, for years and find a better way for any of those? Any sort of pet? Yeah, well, I mean, I think another um, model which has been called into question is, is Myers-Briggs, um, of course, which, the, which is all around, you know, personality types. And uh, there, there is another model which is, um, I think, far more widely accepted within psychology generally uh, around sort of the five personality traits. Um, and in fact, Jeffrey Miller's written a very good book which she suggests that perhaps there might be six um but um but that tends to be the model that psychologists reference and then find to be much more credible whereas i believe in the world of marketing we companies um and businesses particularly from an hr perspective are still leaning very heavily on myers-briggs um which in fact has far less um sort of substance to it in terms of its um how it was developed so that's another possible model which we might um explore further down the line but I imagine there's probably plenty out there. Hmm. Have it, has it occurred to you that sometimes the, there's a trade-off between simplicity and complexity that you need to get to grips with when you're suggesting alternative approaches? Um, I think for sure. Um, I mean, to some extent, you need to work within the frameworks that a company or a client or a brand is, is familiar with. But I do also think that if... Uh, a better way of working or a more accurate model um, for helping us um, in our thinking emerges, then it's kind of incumbent on us to explore and, and prod around that. And I, you know, I think it's probably fair to say that evolutionary psychology is something that we've been grappling with for the last year or so. And it did take us quite a long time to arrive at a sense of how it, it fits into the world of research. Um, because I mean, it does help us understand, um, you know, um, behavioural economic biases much more clearly, I think, um, which is a topic that the research world has been very interested in now for some time. Um, but I think beyond that, what we have um, finally, I think, um, the, the way in which it's mo been most useful to us is, is, is just giving us a, a really accurate, helpful framework for understanding human behavior. Because what we know now, and what every element of, of psychology and science is, is showing us, is that people are not good witnesses to their own behavior. Uh, and they are not accurate, um, they don't give us accurate testimony in terms of um, the decisions and behavior that they make. The more frameworks that we have that help us infer why people do what they do, instead of us having to rely on asking them why they do what they do, um, the, the, more, the more useful it is to us as researchers. And I think evolutionary psychology, and particularly the seven fundamental motives, is, is a really useful model to, to achieving that. 
Thank you. Now, I was going to say that just about wraps it up, but we've got one last question, so I'm just going to sneak it in. So hopefully you might be able to give a short answer. Um, how does moral psychology fit with evolutionary psychology? Well, I think this comes down to the last slide that I'm on our um, uh, presentation about, you know, in order to, um, uh, you know, understand, we have to understand the puppeteer in order to understand ourselves. And, you know, evolutionary psychology actually presents in many respects quite an, um, an unpleasant side of, of human nature that we are selfishly motive that, you know, maybe we're more chimp than bonobo in some respects. And a lot of people have, have been quite uncomfortable with it. Um, that doesn't necessarily uh, follow, therefore, that we that we have to, um, follow our instinctive nature um, and that in fact probably the best way to achieve harmony and collaboration morality integrity in our society um, is, is to understand what our natural impulses are likely to be in given situations and then work with that so I think that a lot of people make the mistake of thinking that evolutionary psychology says um, this is our natural behavior therefore this is how everybody should be and this is how everyone should behave um, but I think in fact what it does is give us um, uh, an insight into our own behavior that shows us how we can um, live more harmoniously together um, by understanding where those impulses come from. Okay, thank you very much. So thanks both to both of you for joining us today and sharing that fascinating presentation.